Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. We um, I actually I'm not gonna lie, I kind of hate recording this before the market week ends, uh, because of the enhanced volatility in the market. I uh, just don't like the idea that people are viewing and watching and listening before um, the you know. Well, I'm recording something that by the time you're listening could very well be outdated. And that doesn't happen a ton, but I'm recording right now on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, market's already closed, and I'll share with you what's going on so far week to date. But again, we still have a full day Thursday and a full day Friday, and and I have meetings on Thursday. They're going to keep me from recording tomorrow, so we're doing it early. And I set all that up because that's kind of now the environment we're in. And I'll tell you something else. I actually think it's the environment we could be in for a while. And and what I mean is the idea of, you know, dropping 600 points on Monday as we did this week and then going uh, up um, a couple hundred on Tuesday. We were down a couple hundred Wednesday, but closed up a couple hundred. And this is a volatility that is biased to the downside, but up and down by definition and um, driven by uncertainty. Uh, an uncertainty that itself is driven by the trade war issues I'm about to spend most of our time talking about. And so to the extent that the uncertainty may not go away for a little while, the volatility should not go away. And therefore, I have this kind of risk every week of recording the video like five minutes too early, let alone a couple of days too early. So there you go. That's our setup. The story in markets isn't the trade war. You you can find perhaps some um, secondary uh, uh, narratives in there, but I don't really think they'll be very easy to find. I mean, everything's pretty much trading right now around the sentiment that is stemming from this enhanced certain uncertainty. Uh, so the really quick summary, we know that a week and a half ago, the president announced that China had reversed uh, the progress in the negotiations, and he wanted to put on more tariffs now to punish them for kind of backtracking and where they thought they were headed. Uh, Chinese negotiators were with U.S. negotiators last Thursday and Friday. All of them reported that the talks went well, but there was no announcement of anything particularly, you know, prog you know progress oriented that had been done. And the United States did go through with an additional 20, uh, well, uh, an additional 15 percent. They raised tariffs um, from 10 to 15 to 25 and we went up to $200 billion of imports that are now being tariffed at that level. It'll take a couple months for these things to really kick in. But my point being, that's now been done, and then it will play out in the couple months ahead. In theory, if they were to have some deal that gets worked out in the next three weeks, I don't think any products would have even shipped that would fall under the new tariff. So there is still some kind of time lag but the point is that uh, announcement is in motion already. And then this week, uh, uh, on Monday, the Chinese announced their retaliatory tariffs um, going up to $60 billion, uh, various household products. It was over 2,400 items that they export to the United States that they've now put this additional tax on. And, and the market dropped over 600. At one point, it was down, it was down well over 700 points on Monday, okay? So uh, this is what trade war does. You go back and forth and each side kind of making the news a bit worse. And and so I can understand where um, uncertainty would elevate. I lay out uh, in this week's Dividend Cafe the kind of three major categories of outcome. And, and, what, and I'm going to stand by those three now, although one of them I think has gotten to be lesser likely, less likely, However, I think blended with the second one, you kind of have a combined outcome that may play. But first is just that there's this sort of short-term resolution. All of a sudden, there's a phone call, there's a meeting, there's a tweet, there's a this or that, and boom, we have this deal, and it's beautiful, and it's uh, the best deal ever, and, and you know, markets just have a stunning melt-up around the idea of a uh, quicker-than-expected resolution Probably in that scenario, under the hood, there's some things that are not as good about the deal, but at least to markets, it becomes very uh, positive. The second outcome is that there is not a deal anytime immediate. Perhaps when President Trump, President Xi meet at the G20 in China in another four or five weeks, 
uh, they set the the tone and the kind of context for what will become this sort of grand compromise, grand face saving. Uh, China referred to it as them needing to preserve the dignity of their nation. So there's a lot of narrative preservation going on on both sides. Um, but I think that to get to that point, we're out of a four or five week outcome that goes into maybe eight to 12 weeks, something in that range. Think that things have to get bad enough that one of the other sides, you know, really kind of bites. And uh, that, that um, you know, is a difficult thing to predict, obviously, when exactly that could happen, what that pain threshold may be. Um, these are tricky situations because they're, I, I really do believe that politically right now, it's not hurting the president. I think he's mostly able to play off of the I'm sticking up to China. No one's ever stuck up, stuck up to China, stuck, stood up to China. Um, finally, we're getting something done. They're hurting more than we're hurting. All true enough. And the market believes it's going to get resolved so well, so much that the market's not dropping enough to change that presidential narrative. And so he's kind of in this little sweet spot where things are not great in the markets, but they're not falling apart. And it's good enough that he feels emboldened to keep pushing. And so the fear, of course, is that there's no warning when all of a sudden that moment changes. When the narrative changes from my blue collar manufacturing uh, American base uh, loves what I'm doing to China, to that sw shifts to a narrative of the economy's falling apart. This president doesn't know what he's doing politically, you know. So those things uh, are what he's trying to balance and keep from happening. And I really think the stock market's the best barometer to maybe tell him when he's gone too far. The market has gone down, but not enough to really um, force him into any action. Now, of course, there's a lot of leverage with China. Their economy is very vulnerable, and that could very well be what breaks the thing. Now, the third outcome is the one I think is least likely, but certainly most painful, and that would be if the president decided, forget it, I'll take my chances in 2020. I'm going to throw on all these tariffs. I'm going to escalate up to $500 billion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer China, and then we'll see what happens. And for that to happen, I think China would have to say, okay, we'll, we'll take it because we think you're going to lose in 2020, and we'll, and we'll work this out with your you know, successor. And I don't see China doing that because I don't believe that China has a lot of confidence that the president's going to lose re-election. And that would be a very dangerous game of chicken for them to play, just as I think the tariff war uh, that our president's playing is a somewhat dangerous game of chicken, too. But that third option is out there. Markets cannot discount that to a 0% probability. So my guess is that some blend of the first and second ends up being the reality. So therefore, we're in the situation of managing the short-term volatility and, and concerns around that, blended with the kind of intermediate resolution we expect will come. Um, and that in, in a in a very uh, human way, you say, has to come just based on the political reality in the United States, the economic reality for both countries, et cetera. So um, let me, there's a couple other things that we want to go through. Uh, in this week's Dividend Cafe, I, I do kind of elaborate on how important this is to capital expenditures and economic sentiment. I, um, I expect, I like my numbers. I re ran a study this morning. I think you're going to be looking at about a $1.4 billion hit to consumer spending per month in the United States as long as the tariffs are on. And $1.4 is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of percentage impact in a country that spends the amount of money that we spend. But those things will add up as more time goes by. Um, look, there's a number of reasons I'll get into now why this idea people are throwing out about China using the $1.2 trillion of our debt that they hold, why I don't really take seriously that they can gain any leverage out of that. Uh, first and foremost, um, if they start dumping debt, it pushes yields up, it tanks their own value, and it hurts us, except for then it creates a carry trade with other central banks, other sovereign wealth nations. They come in with, and buy the debt, and it ends up that it hurt China but doesn't hurt the United States for more than a week or two or three and and that's just the economic reality of it. But also, China can't dump that debt and they just have the money sit under their mattress. They got to do something with the money they get in selling the debt. So are they going to go to yen and create a huge problem in their trading thing with Japan? Are they going to go to euro um, and, and, and let that dynamic completely change, let alone the instability of the euro currency? 
So China can threaten it. I don't know that they even have. I just hear U.S. media pundits talking about it. But um, look, I, that so-called nuclear option, I think, is much to do about nothing um, other than their attempt to maybe bluster with it a little bit. So uh, that's enough on the tariff and trade stuff side for the week. I'm just looking over some of the things I wrote about here in Dividend Cafe so far. Um, the overall market environment this week, if, if we were ending the week right now, we lost 600 points. That's a lot. Not, not huge. A couple percent. And then we gained half of it back so far. Uh, a little more than half of it back. So, you know, uh, I mean, geez, it, it, this could be so much worse. So much worse. And maybe it will get worse. We have to see how it plays out. Um, but I stand by what I said in the Advice and Insights podcast I did Monday. Everybody knows the president wants a deal. Everybody knows China needs a deal. And I, for the sake of people who don't like short-term volatility, which is caused by uncertainty, I wish that we would get the deal sooner than later. But I believe most people believe that is what is actually going to end up happening. And I don't want to take, I don't want to take lightly the possibility that it gets worse before it gets better. So we're staying neutral. We're staying balanced. We're staying middle of the road. That's the basic theme that you can't afford to become too conservative here, too defensive and miss what is the ultimate outcome we expect. And you can't afford to become uh, too opportunistic and premature in in trying to play on it because it certainly could have more downside pain along the way. Um, That's where things stand. It's a great time to be a dividend growth investor, first of all, because it's always a great time to be a dividend growth investor. And secondly, because you add to your long-term return as an accumulator capital when you have volatility because the dividends are paying and reinvesting at lower prices if everything's always going a straight line up, they're reinvesting at higher prices. So math works against you in that scenario. The math is working for those of us who are long-term investors and accumulators of capital via dividend growth investing. That's the Dividend Cafe video for the week. Forward it around, send it around. If you liked what you heard and saw, uh, you know, give us a little rating, thumbs up, whatever they do on YouTube and Vimeo and the different ways you watch it. But um, I will have the Written Dividend Cafe uh, with more charts, more elaboration of these things. encourage you to always read that as well. And I do appreciate you viewing. And we'll be back at you next week with more good stuff. Take care.